I first met Ramona when I was in college. Back then she was stocky, with big glasses and bad skin. She majored in art and dressed strangely. I guess you could say that she had her own style. Unfortunately, her independent talent was not something that most guys found sexy or even attractive, myself included. Even though she was an art major and I was a production technology major, we had the same program requirements and ended up taking computer graphics design classes together. She needed a class for her diploma program, and I needed a class as a prerequisite for AutoCAD. We were assigned to do a group project together, and although we took a few classes together, we had never spent much time with each other or even talked before. From the very beginning, we were almost complete opposites. I was running around the track and hanging out on the periphery of the popular crowd. She smoked and hung out on the periphery of the avant-garde, the beatniks, the artistic sect. I dated mostly level two cheerleaders and jocks. She was the fat friend and second girlfriend to most of the really beautiful or just really slutty art chicks. While working on our project, we were forced to spend a lot of time together. Human nature made me stare at her. This probably made her look at me too. Anyway, one evening, we had a long conversation that gradually went beyond the scope of the project and became more personal. My next girlfriend came to pick me up and I was a little sad to leave Ramona. I could also see that she wasn't happy about it either. The next day when we met in the computer class, Ramona was very cold towards me. Okay, what did I do now? I asked her. You're a fucking idiot, she said, almost crying. I grabbed her hand and led her out of the laboratory to avoid a scandal. In the park opposite, we sat on a bench and I told her not to move. I ran and grabbed a soda for myself and her favorite juice from the cart that sold them nearby. Now that we were comfortable, the argument could continue without distraction or embarrassment on either side. So why am I an asshole? I asked, smiling. Because you are, she said, wiping her tears. Even though you have no artistic soul, I thought you were different, she said. We were having a good time, and I really started thinking, and then you... With that bitch. Are you mad at me for going on a date? I asked incredulously. Hell no, she spat. It's just that you guys are all alike. You don't want a relationship with a woman who actually feels something for you and loves you. You just want sex with some big-breasted girl with no brains. Well, I said calmly, big-breasted chicks are smart enough to do one thing that gives them an edge, whether it's dating, relationships, or just sex. She looked at me doubtfully and asked, What thing? They're asking, I snapped. They communicate. They do things to let the guy know that they are interested. She couldn't think of anything to say, she just sat there, clenching her fists and fuming with anger. I could almost see smoke coming out of her ears and I wanted to clear the air and see where we really stood, so I reached over and pulled those giant glasses off her nose, they were really bad and in the way, and kissed her. Not just a smack, but a pretty good, passionate kiss. I later found out that this was the first time she had kissed a guy who was not related to her. That first kiss was followed by an even better one as she relaxed and parted her lips slightly and our tongues began to massage each other. I hugged her, pulled her to me, and we kissed for a long time on a park bench. The next few weeks were a flurry of activity. We finished the project, received an A+, and started dating. Ramona got out her contact lenses, went to the dermatologist, and started dressing a little more normally. I never asked her to give up bohemian outfits, but when we started going out more often, she needed more things. You know women, she invited me to go shopping with her and asked my opinion. I would mention how everyone wore jeans, including artists. Then she said that she was too fat for pants. Then I would tell her that I like her curves and how some men like to see a well-rounded ass on their women. I reminded her of the artist Rubens and his voluptuous models. She bought jeans and looked great in them. I would tell her that her tops and sweatshirts didn't go well with the jeans or skirts she was wearing. And she said that I just want to look at her tits. And I would tell her that she was right, but they were still mine, and she was just wearing them for me.
Sex with Ramona was like sex with a fairy tale princess. Even though he wasn't wild and uninhibited, he was still special. Since I was her first, I tried to make it fun and special for her. After some time, she became even more interested in it and even began to demand it from me. We were never too kinky, but I took what I could get because I loved her so much. A few weeks later, she looked at herself in the mirror and told me that she looked like a larger version of the big-breasted bimbo she hated so much. I told her that maybe so, but she was my girlfriend. We were very happy and got engaged after graduation. I went to work at an automotive design firm and Ramona did layouts for an art magazine. My family loved Ramona and welcomed her with open arms. Ramona's mom and sister were her only family. To put it mildly, I didn't like them. I once heard her sister tell someone at our engagement party that Brad, it's okay if you like guys like that. But I was too normal and probably stifled her artistic vision. Ramona looked beautiful and happy, but I heard her mom tell her sister that she thought we were getting married because Ramona was pregnant and it wouldn't last long. Over time, we proved them both wrong. We were happy and loved each other. At our seventh anniversary party, her mom started asking when she was going to be a grandma. Ramona and I were her only chance at grandchildren because her sister was incapable. We're trying, mom, Ramona said quickly. We tried for several years, but nothing worked. Don't worry, I made an appointment for both of you, said Maddie, Ramona's mom. She took it upon herself to enroll in a fertility clinic. Naturally, my turn was a week early because I suspect she thought the problem must be with me. Anyway, I went to the appointment, had my blood tested, and provided other fluids, and it turned out that everything was fine. When Maddie heard the news, she suggested that we practice more until we finished work so she could be a grandmother while she was still young. However, Ramona's tests were different and changed our lives forever. We found out that she had several problems with her reproductive organs, which made having children for us, although not impossible, but extremely improbable. That night, I held her and held her close as she cried herself to sleep. I told her that we could always adopt a child or get any of the treatments currently available. In my heart, I hated her mother for bringing the situation to this state. If you want a divorce, you can get it, she told me through tears. I will never leave you until you force me, Mona, I told her. Mom said that you will cheat on me in order to have children. Mona, I will never cheat on you. You are my life, I said. She looked into my eyes and asked, Why do you want to stay with a fat girl who can't have children? I looked into her eyes, making sure she could see my every expression, and told her, Because I love you more than anything in the world, and it will kill me if I stay without you. I think she calmed down a little and went to sleep. But to be honest, those days are so blurry now that I can't remember all the details. Two days later, the clinic called and asked us to come for an appointment. We sat down with the doctor and were concerned when she said she had referred Ramona's tests to a specialist. We were even more shocked to learn that Ramona was in the early stages of a very aggressive strain of cancer. Then all the pieces fell into place. This explained why, at 25, she was always tired for no reason. This explained the soreness of her body some days and her frequent irritability and mood swings. It also scared the crap out of me. Luckily for us, we caught it early enough that the prognosis for her survival was good. She referred us to a specialized oncology facility and made an appointment for the very next day. Ramona had a very long and relatively invasive battery of tests. I took some time off and stayed with her the whole time. I was in the room with her, holding her hand during each test and cheering her on as we waited for each result. Over the next few weeks, Ramona had surgery to remove some lymph nodes and began a radiation therapy program. I stayed in the family suite at the cancer center to sleep next to her. I was there every morning when she woke up and all day. I was even allowed to stay with her overnight until she fell asleep. Her mother and sister visited her from time to time and were always cold to me. I think they thought I had somehow given her cancer. The radiation therapy didn't seem to work and was starting to destroy healthy tissue, not just the cancerous tumors, so we abandoned it in favor of chemotherapy. Ramona had lost about 40 pounds as a result of the radiation, and chemotherapy was probably going to take away her hair. 
The nurses at the hospital were always angels to me, and they often went above and beyond their job to help me do things for Ramona. One nurse was a godsend. Her name was Kelly, and she was very beautiful. She was tall, slender, and seductive, with bright red hair and green eyes. She always smiled or joked for me every morning when I walked in. She was also there with a hug or a shoulder when I really needed help keeping my cheerful face on. Most nurses in the oncology department worked four 10-hour shifts and had three days off. Kelly worked from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. She was there when I left Ramona at night and there when I returned at 6 a.m. the next day. She was always cheerful, at least around me. The only time I remember her getting upset was when she was talking to Ramona's mother, Maddie. Maddie commented that I would probably leave her daughter now that she was sick. Kelly attacked her like I've never seen her before and threatened to throw her to the floor. This place is fucking depressing, she said. Most of our patients have very few visitors. Their family and friends are staying away because they can't see them or are afraid the disease may be contagious, she continued. This man never leaves her side. When she feels bad, he is the one who holds the bucket into which she vomits and then wipes her up. You were here? She asked. When she needs to relieve herself, he walks her to the toilet and helps her. You were here when she started losing her hair? He shaved his head to make it look similar? She laughed, remembering my shiny skull. Were you here at that time? She asked irritably. He gives her a sponge bath so she can carry herself with dignity and not have someone else do it, she said. You were here? She asked again. He spent all his vacation and sick leave on her. Her health insurance won't pay for the treatment, so he's deeply in debt for your daughter, she stated. And all this time he's been here every day, every damn day. Holding her hand and letting her know that someone loves her no matter what, she snapped. The next thing you say to or about this person will determine whether you can return to this floor, so be careful, Kelly said, pointing her long, pointy finger at Maddie's face. I wish I had been there to see it. But when I heard about it later, I smiled a little. But the most important thing for me was that Ramona felt better. Several nurses told me about this, and they were all equally angry at Maddie. I noticed that Maddie was much less cold towards me, though, after this fact. She even reached out and patted me on the shoulder when I held Ramona's hand while she took an afternoon nap. The chemotherapy took its toll on Ramona and left her much weaker but without cancer. Her hair started to grow back, and we started her on a new diet to help her regain her strength. She then required several plastic surgeries to remove a lot of excess skin that resulted from her weight loss. Ramona was the new woman, 80 pounds lighter, and her skin even cleared up. Ramona now wore contact lenses rather than glasses, and her hair had come back. Everyone who knew her had to take a second look at her. She wasn't a wild beauty like Kelly, but she was the best Ramona she could be, and I still only loved her. I went back to work and had to work many more hours to pay for all the medical expenses we incurred. Ramona was unable to return to work for some time. Our sex life had always been great, even before we got married. But it intensified now that Ramona seemed determined to let me know how glad she was that I had stayed with her during her illness. She started dating some girls, from her old job, just to pass the time while I was working. I was glad she did, because outside of me, she was never a very outgoing person. Now, it seemed, she needed to go out and show herself to people. I guess I thought it was some kind of life affirmation after cancer, and didn't really take it seriously, but I didn't know that my marriage was on the rocks. Over the next few weeks, Ramona began coming home later and later. Sometimes she came drunk. I've never had so much fun in my life, she said. I felt a little bad because I was working 12 or 16 hours a day to pay her medical bills and she was having fun without me. She began to dress much more revealing than ever. When I asked her about it, she said that she had never had a body like this before and she wanted to show it off. It was just fun. I was wondering when it became necessary for her to show this to people other than me. I've been thinking a lot about our marriage that week. I guess deep down I was worried that something was going on. I didn't want to face the truth because by that time Ramona was my whole world. 
Everything we've been through with cancer and everything else has strengthened our bond much deeper than ever before. My hard work brought benefits that I didn't know about, although all my extra time and effort to try to make a dent in Ramona's medical expenses brought me to the attention of the owners of the company I worked for. I received a big raise and promotion. I also received a bonus that I figured I could use this time to go somewhere nice for a vacation with my wife. I didn't try to tell Ramona the good news, but decided to throw a small, just family surprise party for her birthday, which was next week, and tell her then. Maybe moving away together is just the thing that will reignite the flame and get us back on track. The events of the next few days broke my heart and destroyed our marriage. Ramona went to the hospital for a routine checkup to make sure the cancer had not yet developed. They ran some tests and told her they would get back to her with the results. On the way out, Ramona ran into Kelly. Ramona never liked Kelly because Kelly was beautiful and she still thought she was that fat girl. Even now that Ramona had lost weight, she knew she was no match for Kelly next to her. Hi Ramona, Kelly said. It's so strange to see you without your sweet husband. What do you mean, I'm not without him, Ramona said. He's just at work. And anyway, why are you asking about him? I didn't mean anything like that. You're just very lucky that you have someone who loves you so much, she said. Most of the guys out there just want to get what they can get and have some fun. After a while, they fall off. If only someone looked at me the way your husband looks at you, Kelly began before being interrupted. Yes, it doesn't matter, said Ramona. Ramona knew I would be stuck at work all day again, and she just wanted to get back to something fun. So she headed towards the bar she had been to the night before. She could probably have a drink and be home before I got there. When Ramona entered the bar, she was grabbed by someone's arms. Oh, God, I haven't seen you in at least a couple of years, Ramona. It was Kathleen Kinnison, one of Ramona's old college friends. What are you doing to yourself lately? You've lost a lot of weight. I almost didn't recognize you, said Kathleen. How is your husband doing? She asked. Hey, Kat, Ramona said. I'm just hanging out and having fun. They walked up to the table and were soon joined by a group of guys. Ramona got up to dance with one of the guys and was so carried away that she didn't notice the door open. All the guys in the bar noticed when Kelly walked through the door. Ramona was too busy dancing to pay attention to her. But Kelly saw her, saw what she was doing and with whom. Kelly ordered a sandwich from the grill and went back to work with a new idea. Over the next few days, I worked as hard as usual and still found time to plan Ramona's surprise party. I invited her mother, sister, and several of their friends. I bought her a few gifts and really hoped that this party and trip would reignite the sparks between us. I was pleasantly surprised when my mother-in-law volunteered to help me decorate the apartment for the party. During Ramona's hospital stay, we became a little closer, and she may not have loved me, but she respected my love for her daughter and accepted me. Over the next few days, I noticed a pattern. When I returned home, Ramona always left and returned very late. Our once strong sex life also declined. I couldn't remember the last time we made love. Women constantly pestered me, as if they sensed my need for release. One evening when I returned from work, the phone rang. Hi Brad, this is Kelly, she said. Hey Kelly, do you have Ramona's test results? I asked. No, not until tomorrow, but I need to talk to you about something, she said. This is very important. Could you meet me somewhere? I promise it won't take long. How about a park across the street from the hospital? I suggested. Kelly thought about it and agreed. I can be there in 20 minutes if you don't mind. See you there, I said. Kelly thought the park was the best place to meet. She went there with Brad several times during Ramona's hospitalization to cheer him up. They had several impromptu dinners while Ramona underwent procedures that he could not attend. It was also the place where she told him that the chemotherapy was showing progress, so it was a place filled with happy memories and she didn't want to ruin that for him. I sat down on a small park bench next to Kelly. I smiled at her and asked, Am I behind on payments? Ramona didn't get sick again, did she? Yes, she's sick again. 
but it's not cancer, Kelly said. Over the next few minutes, Kelly told me about the places she had seen my wife lately. She told me what she saw and what she did. She even told me about some of the guys she saw her with. I don't have pictures or anything, but it's pretty clear she's cheating on you, she said. Kelly, you are a wonderful nurse, and until now I thought you were a wonderful person too. Ramona would never do that. She loves me, I said, although I didn't believe my words. I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have to be careful, Kelly said. I just hate the thought of her doing this to you. I don't believe she's doing anything, I snapped. And all you have are vague suspicions. No evidence, no evidence. Maybe it's better for you to mind your own business? I stood up and started to leave, but Kelly grabbed my hand. She gently raised her hand and touched my cheek. For some reason I froze in place and my growing anger dissipated. For your sake, Kelly said softly, I hope I'm wrong. It kills me to think that you're going through all this pain for someone who isn't worth your little finger. She gently stroked my cheek and I swear I felt electricity. When you need a friend, I'll be there, she said, put a business card in my hand and left. I put the card in my pocket and watched Kelly walk away. It had been a long time since Ramona and I had made love, and I was hard as a steel rod watching Kelly's ass. Everything went better than I expected, Kelly thought. If he found out too late, it would hurt him even more than now that he was warned. It's better to have a couple of small blows than one big crushing blow. She would never hurt Brad for any reason, but he needs to know about his cheating wife. Kelly couldn't remember exactly when she fell in love with Brad. It didn't matter anymore. It was probably during this time that she watched him come to the hospital every day, regardless of the need to take care of Ramona. Or after she started to get better and started treating him like he was her butler, and not a husband who had just gone through months of sacrificing everything in his life to be with her. Kelly knew she was beautiful. She had heard it all her life. She had been with many guys, but none of them treated her with as much love and tenderness as Brad treated Ramona. She couldn't think of anything she wouldn't give to have someone like that in her life. She was ready for step two or her plan. When I got home two nights later, I was excited. The party, although small, was supposed to be the start to rekindle the romantic flame with Ramona. Over the past few days, I've started paying more attention to what's going on between us and I've discovered that she's been acting distant and drinking too much. When I finally fell asleep, she was still not there. When I woke up, she was already asleep. She smiled and rolled over when I told her I was planning something special for her birthday. I knew she was probably drinking and partying a little, but it was Ramona after all. When we first met, she was against parties. Now she was just trying to experience some things that fat Ramona had never experienced. She also celebrated success in her fight against cancer. I just wanted her to celebrate with me, but maybe I was just being selfish. Ramona's mother. Maddie arrived at 6.30 with her second daughter, Ravana. They started decorating the house and worked quickly because they knew she would be there at any moment. Only six people were invited because I wanted to have a small intimate get together with a few close friends. By nine o'clock in the evening, everyone was already wondering where Ramona was and some guests left their gifts and went home. By 11 p.m., Maddie, Ravona, and I were the only ones there. I called Ramona's cell phone a fourth time to find out where she was. Ramona called back half an hour later. Hi, darling. I'll be home soon, Ramona said in a drunken and out-of-breath voice. Where are you? I asked. Mom wanted to invite me somewhere for a drink, and I decided to go somewhere with her rather than return home. We lost track of time, she said. I actually went out with her and my snotty sister because they still don't like you very much, and I didn't want their bad attitude to ruin whatever surprise you had in store for me, she said. I heard some guy in the background asking her to hurry back so they could have some fun. In any case, we will see each other soon, and you can give me a surprise, she continued. Is this a big surprise? she asked. Sort of, I said quietly. For some time, no one said anything. Then Maddie looked at me. 
She saw that I was trying my best not to cry in front of her. I was shocked. It was like my whole world had come to an end, and I didn't know exactly how to react. You know that's not entirely true, Maddie said. Well, maybe at first I thought you were just not right for Ramona, but that's not the case now, she said. What a bitch, Ravana said. Well, ladies, thank you so much for coming, I said. I'll clean up this mess and put away Ramona's gifts, I said. I'm sure she'll be back soon. You can stay here as long as you want, but I'm not sure it will do you any good to be here when she gets home, I said. Why not? asked Ravana. As her snotty sister, I'd like to see her reaction when she walks in and gets caught in her damn lie. She went through a terrible ordeal with cancer, I told her. None of us knows what it was or what it did to her. All we can do is be there for her and hope for the best, I said quietly. Maddie and Ravana shook their heads as they left. I went to the closet and started collecting clothes and some personal items. It didn't take me long to pack my things, so I left a note for Ramona on the kitchen table. I packed as much stuff as I could so I wouldn't have to go back for a while. The next day, I was looking for a divorce lawyer while I was at work. I found a few ads online but didn't call any of them. I barely spoke to anyone, and all my colleagues thought I must have been battling a cold or flu. Ramona called me on my cell phone a couple of times and left messages, but I didn't answer. I followed the same pattern for three days. Go to work. Go home to the motel room where I was staying. Sleep. Get up and repeat it again and again. On the third day, Kelly sat on the hood of my car as I left the building. She was on the verge of tears, and I didn't know why. Why the hell didn't you call me? She asked. I didn't answer. I just looked at her and the wall I had built to block out my emotions came crashing down. As tears flowed down my cheeks, I quietly said, Everything you told me turned out to be true. Kelly jumped off the car and hugged me. I felt like a pervert noticing my arousal when her breasts pressed against my chest. I didn't mean to hurt you. Forgive me if you can, she said. Ramona looked around her apartment. Her head was simply killing her. What day is today? She asked. Brad will need to clean this damn place up when he gets home. Why isn't he home yet? What is this knock? She stood up, hobbled naked to the door, and looked out the peephole. Phew, it was her mother. She grabbed her robe and opened the door. Sorry about the mess, Mom, she said. My husband seems to disappear at work, she continued. Ramona, where were you and what were you doing? Maddie asked. Or, judging by your appearance, with whom you engaged in fornication, she continued. Mom, what are you talking about? Ramona asked irritably. Ramona, why do you have hickey marks on your neck? Maddie asked. Oh, damn, Brad better not see this, Ramona said. Mom, bring me some coffee, my head is pounding, she asked. Maddie reluctantly went into the kitchen and started making coffee. So how did you hide your lie that night? Maddie asked. What lie, Mom? asked Ramona. The lies you told your husband on your birthday, Maddie said. Ramona, when you told him you were with me and your sister, we were standing here next to him at the time, Maddie said. Ramona's eyes snapped open. I better think of something to say before he gets home, she said. You have to help me come up with a plan, Mom. Why should I? Maddie asked. Mom, I understand that I did some things that I shouldn't have done, she said. But it was all just for fun. I just wanted to be able to do things I never did when I was younger, she said. When I was younger, I was Fat Ramona. Always the fat friend of the hot girl, never the one they wanted, she said. Then I met Brad, and everything changed, she said. I became more confident. I dressed better because to him I was the hot girl. But to him I was just a hot girl, and only because he loves me. But now that I've lost weight, I'm getting the attention of more and more guys, which is refreshing, she said. Now I can play with them a little and throw them away whenever I want. Now I have a choice, and it's fun, she said. This is not serious. I would never truly leave Brad because I love him. I'm just having a little fun, she said. But you said it yourself, Mom, that he's ordinary and boring. 
and Brad will never know anyway, she said. He always works anyway, she continued. He better get involved in the game, otherwise he will lose me. Just like now, he should be home by now, she said. That's probably true, Maddie said quietly. She walked up to Ramona and handed her the note she found in the kitchen. Dear Ramona, I'm really glad you're having fun. After what you've been through, you deserve it. Almost no one beats cancer, but you entered this fight and won. You didn't just defeat him, you destroyed him. In fact, you came out a stronger, even more beautiful person than before. From the very beginning, I knew you were special, and I fell madly in love with you. Now you have the confidence to go out and let everyone see how special you are and how big your heart is. You deserve it too. Now I understand that there is simply no place for me in your life and in your heart. After all, you won my heart a long time ago, and you deserve to keep moving forward. I hope you get this note tonight and call me so we can talk about where we go next, if we go anywhere at all. If I don't hear from you tonight, I'll just assume the worst and file for divorce so you can be free of me. You can take the apartment because I still won't be able to return there. There are too many memories there. I just hope your next man is more worthy of you than I am. I tried my best, did everything I could for you. Obviously, I was lacking in something, and you deserve better. I will always love you. Brad. After reading the letter, Ramona collapsed on the floor, sobbing. Maddie looked at her daughter and thought, what a fool I raised. Across town, Kelly took Brad to her home. She walked around the car and opened the door. She reached out and pulled his limp arms to pull him out of the car. She walked him to her door and opened it, pulling him inside. She sat him down on the sofa and started talking to him. She could tell he had been on autopilot for days, just going through the motions. But now he has completely crashed. He's much stronger than he thinks, she thought. I'm going to help him get rid of this bitch. Kelly knew now was not the time to share any remaining information about Ramona with him. Brad and Ramona have been under surveillance by a detective firm for the past week. She knew the exact date and time he left her, but wanted to give him a few days before meeting him. Ramona had done much more than Brad knew, and she wasn't sure his fragile psyche could handle it. She left Brad sitting on the couch and changed into shorts and a t-shirt. She cooked them dinner of steaks and salad. She ate her steak while Brad moved his fork around his plate thoughtfully. During all this time, neither of them spoke a word. After dinner, Kelly checked Brad's cell phone, turning it off on purpose just in case. There have been no messages on it yet. This was a good sign, which meant the bitch was still too drunk to realize he was gone. Kelly called the hospital and said she would be away for a couple of days on personal matters. Then she asked Brad to call too. He didn't want to miss work because he still had bills to pay and he couldn't do it by missing time at work. Kelly didn't take no for an answer. Brad called and took two days off. Kelly brought him a blanket and laid him on the couch. She hugged him like a child and kissed his forehead. If you need me, I'm here, she said, pointing upstairs to her bedroom. That evening, Ramona called Brad's cell phone 20 times. Pick up this damn pipe, she thought. Where the hell is he? She just needed to explain it to him. She didn't want a divorce. She also could not live without him. He was her rock, her anchor. Yes, she had done some things in the past few weeks, but none of it mattered. It was just fun. Her marriage was her life. Brad was the only person who truly loved her. Even when she was fat and no one else knew she was special, Brad knew. When she got cancer, she didn't beat it. They did. Without him, she would have given up long ago, but he didn't allow it. She remembered thousands of stupid things he had done. She still remembered the day he came in with his hair shaved. How could she be so stupid? She called him again. Then she called him at work. She knew he would be there because he was still working as many hours as he could to pay her medical bills. His boss told her that he took a couple of days off. He also gave her Brad's new office number and reminded her that Brad had been working in a different department since he was promoted. When did Brad get his promotion? Ramona felt very bad. For the first time, she realized that Brad's return might not happen as she expected. Until now, it seemed to her that he was sulking and angry. She could easily overcome his anger by calling him and asking him to come home. Once he gets home, 
a little talk and sex and everything will be fine. She would spend the rest of their lives together to make amends to him. She had thought a lot over the past few hours and realized that her fun probably wasn't worth the risk of losing Brad. She started out so smart. How did she become one of those stupid girls she hated so much in college? She wanted to have a little fun and pamper herself a little. Now she realized that, after all, she was not in control of the situation. Strange men gave her the illusion of control in exchange for what she should only have given to Brad. There was no love, just meaningless, drunken sex. Now all that was left was to ask how much Brad knew and what he needed to forgive her. On the other hand, she will never forgive herself for this. She became the thing she hated the most. Kelly worked Brad very slowly and very carefully. They first went to the hotel and took his clothes and belongings. Then she took him shopping for the things he needed. Then, at her insistence, they moved his belongings to a guest room in her home. She made him speak, at first only a few words, but soon they were already talking with all their might. The only thing they didn't talk about was Ramona. After the two days were up and both had to return to work, she returned his cell phone to him. While she watched, he checked his messages. There were over a hundred calls from Ramona. He deleted them all without listening. His jaw became harder, and she thought he would be okay. When Brad got back to work, he felt better, although he had not yet come to his senses. Some of his colleagues saw Kelly picking him up the other day, and there was a lot of gossip about it. So, Brad, who the hell was driving that red Mustang? Asked his friend Dave. Brad has a damn supermodel on his side, said another colleague. Brad smiled, but didn't say anything. Kelly was definitely beautiful. In terms of pure physical beauty, she was much more beautiful than Ramona. Did he really think so? Brad's good mood took a turn for the worse when someone suggested he was cheating on Ramona with a mysterious redhead. No one knew the true story that Ramona was cheating on him. Everyone thought Brad was fine until it was time to go home. A security guard burst into Brad's office and told him he needed to run to the parking lot immediately. Brad thought someone might have hit or damaged his car. He was unprepared for the scene he found. Brad heard screams before he even got to the parking lot. What the fuck are you doing on my husband's car? You damn family-destroying bitch! Ramona screamed. You left him when you did your magic trick, Kelly answered just as loudly. What the hell are you talking about? asked Ramona. You disappeared into a liquor bottle and turned into a traitor, Kelly spat. Guards kept the women away from each other, but a large crowd had already gathered to watch. Brad walked over to Kelly and put her in the Mustang. He quietly told her to go to her house and said that he would follow her immediately. He then told the guards to detain Ramona for at least 10 minutes and drove off after Kelly. He saw Ramona screaming after him. He still loved her more than ever, but now he was angry. Brad, we need to talk, she shouted. We'll work it out. You still love me? I see it in your eyes. The worst thing is that she was right. Brad left with tears in his eyes. Later, at Kelly's house, Brad was ready to talk. What are you going to do, Brad? Kelly asked. I guess I want to know what happened to my marriage, Brad said. Do you really want to know this? Kelly asked. Of course, Brad replied. I don't think so. Kelly said. She entered her office and pulled out a large manila envelope. She placed it on the table in front of him and said, Everything is here, but please don't open it. What's in the envelope? asked Brad. When I came to tell you about her after I saw her, you said I had no proof, Kelly said. And you were right. I knew what I saw, but just like when it happened to me, I didn't want to believe it, Kelly said. I knew you'd need proof, so I found a private detective to follow her, she said. It didn't cost me anything because he's my cousin and still owes me a favor. I sewed it up several times. There are photographs, audio recordings, receipts, reports, and even video. But believe me, if you still have even an ounce of love left in your heart for her, you don't want to see this, Kelly said. At this point, you know that the evidence is there that she definitely did things that violated her marriage vows. But seeing this will only hurt you more, she continued. 
Once you see the hard evidence, you won't be able to get it out of your mind for a very long time, she said. You begin to understand this. I know it will take you a long time to forget her, but you are starting to come to your senses, she said hopefully. All this file can do is bring you back, but do what you think is necessary, she continued. What will we eat for dinner? Kelly said, turning towards the kitchen. Brad reached into the folder and pulled out the first photo. It clearly showed Ramona lying on a table in what appeared to be a bar. Her dress was hiked up to her waist. There were at least three men there. Up until this point, Brad thought his separation from Ramona was painful. But the sight of the photograph was like a physical blow. He had difficulty concentrating or even breathing. He put the photo back in the folder and threw it across the room. He sat down on Kelly's couch and closed his eyes. He felt Kelly sit down next to him and hug him. The rest of the night they just sat together, not talking. The next morning, they both said they were sick and went to see a divorce lawyer Kelly knew about. I'll try to make this as quick and painless as possible, said Sherry, Brad's new lawyer. You have no children and almost no property. The only thing worth fighting for is her medical bills. I'll pay for them, Brad said. Why? Sherry asked. You're deeply in debt because of her, Sherry said. And how did she repay you, acting like... Well, you know, she said. Anyway, this should be easy. If she tries to fight it, we'll just threaten to release the file and let everyone know who she is, Sherry said. The papers will be ready in a couple of days. Over the next few days, the situation got worse and worse. Ramona was handed the papers and she tore them up. She not only refused to sign them, but even to read them or contact a lawyer. She told Sherry that she would fight the divorce with everything she had and that it would never happen. She finally proposed a legal separation that could, after a year had passed, without permission, begin divorce proceedings. In exchange, she asked for a marriage counselor and begged Brad to come home so they could try to save the marriage. Sherry threatened to change the reason for the divorce to infidelity, which would destroy Ramona's good name and that evidence might leak. Ramona laughed in Sherry's face and asked her to come up with something important. I told you, she snapped. I will do everything to prevent this. If you have to go to Rome to tell the Pope that I'm a traitor, I'll buy you a plane ticket. But no one, especially you or that red-haired bitch, will take my man without a fight, she said. She also refused to listen to any other proposals until she had a chance to talk to Brad. She's so mean, Sherry told Brad later. If I were you, I would go to the meeting, she said. If you refuse to communicate with her, it will look bad in front of the judge. Two days later, Brad found himself in Sherry's office, face to face with Ramona. Why are you doing this to us? She asked. You did this to us, Ramona, he answered calmly. Okay, I got a little out of control, drank too much and ignored you a little, she said. I understand that you have a reason to be upset, she continued. But this is not a reason for you to throw away ten years of our life together, she said seriously. I love you, Brad. You have to believe me, Ramona said. You forgot that you lied to me, deceived me and broke my heart, Brad said. You did a lot of things that I never thought you were capable of. You didn't consider my feelings at all, Ramona, he said. It was all about you and making you feel good. But Brad, I had cancer. You don't know what it is, she said sadly. And after I got over that, I wanted to just explore life for a while, she told him. After defeating something like this, priorities and views change, she said. Ramona, I understand what you're thinking, but you're wrong, Brad said. And now you will have as much time to explore the world as your heart desires. I won't bother you anymore. You can be the biggest slut in the world. You can entertain entire rooms full of guys every night and no one will care. Brad stood up and walked away, and Ramona started yelling at him. Brad, you can't just leave me. What do you mean I'm wrong? Brad leaned back in his chair and motioned for Ramona to sit too. Ramona, you didn't have cancer, Brad said seriously. What? She began as Brad raised his hand to silence her. We had cancer, he said with tears in his eyes. I was there every damn day in the hospital, he snapped. Only it was worse for me. You felt it, but they gave you medicine for the pain, he said. 
I had to sit there and watch illness devastate the person I loved most. Powerless to do anything, but I had to watch. There were times when I felt so guilty that I was ready to do anything, said Brad. If I could take your place, I would, he said. And I could, but I never left you, he told her. I had to pretend to be cheerful so that you could maintain hope and good spirits, he said. But inside, I was dying a little every day. Every night when they forced me to leave you, I went home and cried for hours, he said. I was so afraid of losing you and not spending the rest of our lives together. And then, every morning, I had to put on a cheerful, confident expression again. When it was all over, having gone through it, as you put it, I was just as ready to explore life and have fun, he said. But the person I wanted to have fun with was busy drinking and apparently other men besides the husband who went through it with her, he told her while she looked at her feet. And one of us had to work hard to start paying all your medical expenses, he said. So, you have a new body and a new way of looking at things, and I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. You have new priorities, and my wife is a cheater. You have a new point of view, but from the side you were looking at, you probably didn't see how you were hurting me, he said. You have to explore life and I'm heartbroken, Brad said. You claim to love me? How do you think I'll feel when I hear about all the guys you've had sex with? He asked. I'm sure they're all great guys, Ramona. But where were they when you were in the hospital dying? He asked again. Cancer may not have killed your body, but the consequences certainly killed our marriage. He said seriously. Maybe it wasn't cancer, but just you. He said quietly. Sign the damn papers, Ramona. I have nothing more to say to you, ever. Brad left the room. Ramona sat in a chair for a long time and just cried. Kelly was waiting for Brad outside the lawyer's office. She saw that the meeting was difficult and he didn't need someone to make his depression worse. He was upset and didn't feel very well and didn't want to talk about himself or anything at all. As they walked to Kelly's 2003 Mustang SVT Cobra, Kelly tossed Brad the keys. Brad loved this car. In 2003, the SVT Cobra was also known as the Terminator. For a long time, it was the fastest production Mustang ever made. Take us home, she said, smiling at him. In the end, your divorce will go through, whether she signs the papers or not. Can we just go for a little ride? Asked Brad. No, Kelly said. We have to spend the rest of our lives traveling. You're in pain right now and I have to feed you something, she said. Brad pulled into the parking lot of Kelly's house. They got out of the car and entered the building. Brad took a long look over his shoulder at the car. It would be really fun to drive it for a while longer. Kelly opened the door and went inside without him. As he watched her slowly cross the room, he noticed that she had already taken off her coat and thrown it on the living room floor. She continued to walk away from him towards the stairs leading to her upstairs bedroom. She took off her blouse as she walked and turned to look at him with a smile playing on her lips. As she climbed the first step, she kicked off first one shoe, then the other. Halfway up the stairs, she slipped out of her tights, dangled them from her slender finger, and just stood there motioning for him to follow her. She turned and continued slowly up the long stairs, and when she reached the top, she took off her skirt and left it there. Brad was amazed at the amount of pure alabaster skin on display for him to see. For the first time in weeks, he realized that he was still alive. He quickly climbed the stairs, picking up his discarded clothes as he went. He didn't know why he was lifting. He just did it. When he reached the top of the stairs, Kelly had not yet left. She was waiting for him, but she was busy. In that secretive manner known only to women and circus acrobats, Kelly reached back and unclasped her bra. Freed from their bonds, Kelly's breasts surged forward and quivered. Brad found it hard to breathe as he looked at her and even harder to think. Come and take me, she said, and ran down the corridor. Suddenly, Brad understood the words of the great American press secretary, George Clinton, in his great creation, Atomic Dog. Why should I be like this? Why should I chase a cat? Now, everything was clear. Brad chased Kelly down the hallway to her bedroom. There, he found her waiting for him on the bed. She knelt down and slowly undressed him. 
She took her time and licked each new body part that was exposed as his clothes joined hers on the floor. As the pile of clothes grew, the time approached when they too would be connected only more completely than their clothes. Kelly, I... Brad began. But she stopped him with her finger. Where Ramona was soft and submissive during sex, Kelly was wild and crazy as hell. She was both a participant and a fan. She used her body to let Brad know that she was his. Any time he wanted her. Any time he wanted her. Forever. They did everything they could think of. And in the end, Kelly got what she wanted. She took Brad's thoughts away from Ramona and the past, and on to her and the future. Kelly's first husband cheated on her, so she knew that some men would cheat on anyone, even a beautiful woman like her. She remembered what he said to her when she caught him for the third and final time. A woman, no matter how beautifully she is wrapped, becomes stale after a while, and you need to find a fresh one. She left him immediately after that, and for a long time hoped to find someone who would love her and treat her as special. The way he treated Ramona, she was sure Brad was the guy and she was lucky when his marriage ended. Ramona's loss was her gain, and she will spend the rest of her life treating Brad the way he should be treated. Several weeks later, Ramona still hadn't signed the papers and had no intention of doing so. She tried to get a detective to follow Brad and catch him with Kelly so she could file on her own and possibly have his divorce petition rejected. According to Ramona, this will work because they will be even. She had her passions, he had his, to get revenge, and they could be together again, as they should have been. She just hoped it wouldn't take too long because she missed him so much and she also wasn't feeling well. No one seemed to care about her anymore. When Brad returned home, he would pick her up and make love to her. And he would take care of her, clean their apartment, and make her feel good again. First of all, he will make her feel special again. It may take them a while to get over it, but they will do it. But one day she accidentally saw Brad and Kelly in a restaurant and watched them through the window. Kelly reached across the table and gently touched Brad's cheek. He held her hand in place, turned it, and kissed it. Her Brad didn't do what Ramona planned to do. He should have just had sex with Kelly like Ramona did. But Brad was clearly in love with Kelly. Ramona realized what she had given up and came unstuck. She ran into the restaurant screaming at Kelly. Get away from my husband, you cheap bitch, Ramona screamed. You threw it away, Kelly snapped. No, I didn't do it, Ramona screamed. I was just having fun. I never wanted him to leave me. You won't get my husband, Ramona screamed. I already have it, Kelly snapped. He would already be my husband if you would just sign those damn papers. No way in hell, Ramona screamed again. First, I'll kill you. As they watched, Ramona's face grew very pale. She felt dizzy and could barely stand. She sat down on the floor and said she didn't feel well. Having come to her senses, she left the restaurant. Three months later, Brad and Kelly got married. Ramona, true to her words, never signed the divorce papers. Her cancer returned in full force, and she was hospitalized again. She received great care, but it wasn't the same. Without someone by her side to help her fight the disease, she lost the will to live. She spent a lot of time at the hospital asking about Brad or writing letters to him. She begged him to forgive her and take her back or just visit her. He offered to visit her if only she would sign the papers. This time, the fight against cancer was short and brutal. She wasted away for a month and then died. Brad and Kelly attended the funeral. Brad spoke very eloquently and without rancor about what a special person Ramona was and how much he loved her during their time together. He didn't talk about how things ended between them, only about the good times. At the end, he told the four or five relatives who had gathered about how he and his new bride had decided to name the baby she was carrying after Ramona. Some evenings, sitting in front of the fireplace or driving around in his 2012 Lacuna 302 Mustang, Brad knew both he and Ramona were wrong. Ramona said that she beat cancer. Brad then believed that they beat cancer. In fact, Ramona just got cancer. From the moment she left the hospital, she became a different person. 
loud, angry, vile, and disgusting, she ate everything around her and consumed or destroyed them. Her marriage and relationship with Brad and her family were victims of the cancer she became. Finally, when she couldn't get what she wanted, she turned on herself. Brad and Kelly lived happily ever after. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you like it, press the like button. Subscribe to the channel and press the call button.